Okay. Good afternoon. This special call meeting of the Public Safety Committee in the Nashville Metro Council will now come to order. First, I would like to thank all of you for coming and thank the committee and the council members along with representatives of the Juvenile Court Youth Opportunity Investments, hereafter known as YOI, the Metro Nashville Police Department, Davidson County Sheriff's Office uh, for taking time out, out of all of your busy days and schedules to be with us today. The purpose of today's meeting is to examine the facts and circumstances surrounding the escape of four dangerous juvenile detainees on November 30th, 2019 from the Davidson County Juvenile Detention Center located at 100 Woodland Street here in Nashville. To that end, I have invited representatives of the Davidson County Sheriff's Office, Metro Nashville Police Department, YOI and the juvenile court in order to answer questions and concerns of the council and to give everyone an opportunity to be heard on this issue. As a city, is it, a great, it is of great concern to us that four dangerous juvenile detainees facing serious charges, including murder, could so easily escape detention and create a safety risk to our citizens. The current contract under which YOI is operating expires at the end of June. Pursuant to Bill 2017-542 passed during the previous council, all contracts for the provision of management services for correctional facilities owned by the Metro government executed after January 1, 2017 must be approved by a resolution of the Metro, Metro Council, duly adopted by a minimum of 21 affirmative votes. As such, any contracts will be coming before this committee and the Budget and Finance Committee before heading to the full council for a vote. Procedurally, this meeting will be run under the following rules in order to be respectful of everyone's time and end the meeting no later than 6.30 p.m. YOI and the juvenile court will be given up to four minutes each to make an opening statement. Each committee member will then be given up to four minutes to ask questions of any participants. Afterward, any other council member who is not on the committee will be given the opportunity to ask questions. If time remains, I will come back to the council and committee members who have additional questions to the four minutes they were previously given. At 6.30 p.m., the meeting will conclude, and any further questions, if not uh, answered, will be submitted directly to the respective department and answered into the SharePoint folder. Uh, I would ask that those who are answering questions, representatives from the organizations, be clear and be concise with your answers uh, so that we can get through these questions in an efficient manner. Uh, I would like to also uh, commend the Metro Nashville Police Department for all of their efforts. I know it was tireless in being able to bring these uh, dangerous uh, detainees back into the facility. So we very much appreciate your work on that. Uh, so uh, with that, I would uh, uh, offer what I would like to do is have the juvenile court, uh, if you and all of your representatives can come up here and just sit at this table so that uh, you could easily access the microphone and uh, we will open it up for you uh, to have your opening statement. And are there representatives from YOI here with us? If so, uh, if you'll come forward, I'll offer you up this table and you'll have an opportunity to be heard as well. And it'd be easily accessible for questions. And I don't, uh, uh, for those of you with the police department, the sheriff's department, I, I don't imagine y'all will have as much, uh, uh, as many questions asked of you. So I, I'll just refer you to the, uh, the public podium there when you're called up. Thank you. Judge Calloway, if uh, you guys would like to go ahead, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. I was actually trying to get our other employee, Ms. Williams, to come on up as well. 
Um, good afternoon. Um, good evening. Good evening, all. I want to first thank you, um, Councilman Pulley, for um, asking us and inviting us to come here so that we would have the opportunity to address the community, to address the council, and all those that were involved in this incident. Um, you know, this was a very troubling incident. Um, we, uh, I have to say, I was actually at home on vacation for the Thanksgiving holidays when you never want to get a call from work. Um, about something that is so traumatic. And, you know, it is, um, it was heartbreaking to know that um, we were in part responsible for such a traumatic incident that put the members of our community at risk. And, you know, on behalf of the juvenile court, uh, we do apologize to the community for this incident and we take responsibility for everything that led up to this and we are definitely making um, sure that nothing like this um, to this magnitude that we can control um, happens again in this manner. I want to first also thank, as you have previously, the Metro Police Department for their tireless work in making sure that all of the youth that were involved in this incident were um, re-arrested and brought back into the detention facility. Um, they spent a number of hours um, making sure that everything went well. They did it without any harm to anybody in the community and without any harm to the youth that were involved and without any harm to the police department. And we are super grateful for that. Um, you know, when you think about what could have happened um, and all the things that may have gone wrong, uh, we just have to give a big kudos to um, our police department for making sure that it didn't. I also want to take the time to say thank you to um, Sheriff Hall as well, who has spent time sitting with us as a um, juvenile court and just helping us talk through some of um, security and detention issues. And so he's also done a wonderful job of just lending support and help in areas that we needed to. So, you know, when I think about what happened, um, we do have a private contractor that runs our facility, um, YOI, and we have had them in place for the last five years. And overall, we there have been some positive things that happened with our children and our youth and run with YOI. Um, we also know on the, on the flip side that there have been some issues and there have been some problems as well. Um, staffing is one of the strongest issues that we've dealt with over the past, and it's been a struggle sometimes for YOI to have enough staff um, working in our detention facility and to have a good um, people that are doing it and people that we can feel confident about that are going to make the right decisions all the time. Um, I will say, I know that it's a problem that a lot of the facilities that run, not just juvenile facilities, that also run our adult facilities, staffing is always one of those issues that are hard to really deal with. It's hard to get people, especially um, one of the things that we've talked to about with YOI on a regular basis, it's hard to get people to work in a juvenile facility like the one that we run that deals with the youth who have made the probably the worst decisions of their life and have a lot of behavioral issues, have a lot of mental health issues, um, have a lot of adverse childhood experiences that they're dealing with, um, deal with a lot of trauma. It's difficult to get people, committed people, to really want to put in the hours to work with them day in, day out. And so, especially if the salary is not um, very high, and I think at the time, um, YOI was under a um, plan to try and increase their salaries, and but a lot of those workers were making about $12 an hour. And when you think about you know, working $12 an hour, working at a facility that deals with youth at their worst um, versus working at, you know, McDonald's or um, Chick-fil-A and making about the same amount, it's probably easier, less stress-related and less tra traumatic for someone to choose a job at Chick-fil-A. And so the staffing has been an issue, and it's something that we have worked with YOI, and they have committed uh, after this to make sure that they are um, paying staff more and making sure that we have good, competent staff who can handle the population that we have. 
So there's absolutely no question, and I think YOI will probably say in their statement as well, that the escape was caused by um, employee oversights and um, employee security lapse. And I think they are working tirelessly along with Ms. Williams and um, Ms. Sinback, our court administrator, and Mr. Swack, and making sure that some of the gaps that were happening at that time. Oh man, is that my four? Okay. I apologize, but I, I will yield the floor and answer any other questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Why, why the floor is now yours. Hello, good evening. Um, my name's Jim Hill. I am president of Youth Opportunities. Um, I additionally want to start off uh, this evening by thanking you for giving us the opportunity to explain the story and what we've done to fix some damage we created. I want to start by apologizing for the incident that happened on November 30th that was caused uh, directly by oversight and lack of supervision by my staff. Additionally, I'd like to reach out and thank Metro Police Department too for their tireless hours and efforts in apprehending the youth, as the judge mentioned, without any harm to anyone. Thank you. Um, this uh, issue is um, not to oversimplify, but simply a lack of uh, proper supervision and following, following policy and procedure that's been in place. Um, I'm ashamed of it. I've been involved with the management of this detention center for really over 14 years in a capacity, and I've never had anything close to this. So I'm sorry once again. I'm here tonight to tell you we have worked tirelessly and will continue to to make adjustments, which we've already made, to ensure that nothing like this happens again. Um, the judge, I'll start, she referenced salaries, and she's absolutely correct. We, prior to the escape, we had already even started uh, changing the entry-level salaries to all new hires at $15 an hour, and since that period of time, we've seen some very positive recruiting classes and training classes that have come in, so we're looking forward to that. Additionally, we've added a uh, third uh, entry-level youth care worker position, and they sort of go 15, 16, 17 dollars an hour, sort of give a promotion and a career ladder from within. We think that might help re ret retention, because as the judge mentioned, this is a tough industry and it's tough to keep good staff for a period of time, so we're looking forward to that. Additionally, the shift supervisors who were directly involved in this escape incident have been increased accordingly, so we look forward to that piece. Um, Dallas Scott, he's my Vice President of Programs here in Tennessee, has worked with the team on site um, with uh, new, t everyone's been retrained. Um, I know that sounds simple, but sometimes you get too complacent with this situation, so everyone's been retrained. We've tightened up our security checks, our monitoring, our counts, our movement of the youth. Um, the situation that the youth had access to the elevator, We've corrected that with a piece that only strictly shift supervisors can command that elevator with master control. That wasn't the previous system we had in place. We feel that'll tighten that up and limit it to just one person per shift. Um, additionally, we've... That's, that's pretty much where we're at with it. I think I can expand on that a little, or Dallas could add pieces, but um, we have tightened the ship down and um, I don't want to say it was the perfect storm but the, odd, the odds of this happening and the way it happened are uncalled for and should never happen again with the changes we've made and um, I look forward to answering any additional questions. Thank you sir. I would ask um, uh, any representative from the police department, uh, I do know that uh, the police department conducted an investigation into why this occurred. Uh, would you like to give a brief summary of uh, what actually did occur on that night? Uh, you can be as brief as you would like uh, so that we would have a framework from which to operate here. Okay, in my own, okay. Uh, I'm Sergeant Donegan, I'm over the uh, major case task force with Metro Police. Uh, that was created a few years back. Uh, uh, my unit investigates uh, pretty much uh, all major drug cases, uh, all murders for hire, and any special investigation that the 
uh, chief of police deems necessary. Uh, my unit actually got this investigation. When we started looking at it, the first thing we did was start interviewing all the participants involved as far as the, uh, uh, the people working at YOI. Um, we obtained the videos from YOI as well. Uh, and, and we started, uh, started to piece this thing together. And basically what happened, uh, YOI uses some of the youth there that are incarcerated to help clean the facility. Uh, they're supposed to be locked down at nine o'clock. Uh, no one is supposed to be out after nine o'clock. The supervisor uh, is the one that got these four individuals out after nine o'clock to start uh, cleaning the facility. So right off the bat, there's a violation of policy there. Um, there's a point system that the people have to adhere to to see if they're eligible to be out cleaning as well. Uh, that point system is basically uh, based on their behavior during a certain time frame. Uh, you have to have at least 85 points uh, to be out. Only one of the four had 85 points. The other th three were well below 85 points, one of them being a 35. So it gives you a little idea. So basically three of the four shouldn't even been out cleaning to start with. Um, to break it down further, they're basically cleaning a particular area on one of the floors. Uh, they're supervised by the supervisor and also another one of the corrections officers that is uh, supervising them as well. Uh, the supervisor goes to take the trash out outdoors. He has to take the elevator down to take the trash outside. He takes the elevator out. While he's outside uh, dumping the trash, he gets a call from one of the uh, upper pods uh, that they need him to come to that pod. And basically what's going on is uh, the other young lady watching the prisoners at that time hears a disturbance on the upper pod and she hears them call for the supervisor to come to that pod. She leaves the, three, the four prisoners by themselves at that time, goes up to the upper pod, the supervisor comes up on the elevator. When he gets off the elevator, the doors are left open. He sees the four prisoners there by their self, and he tells them to finish cleaning and go back to their, to their cells. He goes up to the uh, upstairs where the, the issues are going on. During that time, the doors wide open on the elevator. The four juveniles get on the elevator and start trying to push it to the basement where they know they can escape or at least get out. Uh, it's locked down and won't move. They get off after some time of pushing the buttons, trying to get the elevator to move. They see a, another employee guard walking up on the second story. They shout up to that guard, Beach, which is the first, first uh, super, which is the first uh, uh, person watching them that had went upstairs to start with by, and left them alone. They shout up to the uh, second on the se person on the second floor. Beach said to send the elevator down to the basement. She radios to the command room to go ahead and send the elevator down. Uh, keep in mind, this was one of the juveniles that was incarcerated that was telling her this. Uh, soon as uh, soon as they do that, the command center calls back. Did you say send the elevator to the basement? She advised yes. They jump on the elevator, ride the elevator down. Once they get downstairs, they start looking, finding their way out. Um, they're able to strip off their vests. Three of the four at that time, when they got off the elevator, had vests on. Uh, they strip off their vests. They run to the front, uh, front of uh, the juvenile system where the doors are locked on the outside, where the outside can't come in, where you can push the door open, much like most doors are. Uh, they went out those doors and disappeared. Uh, in a very short period of time. They also left a, uh, a mop bucket and thing on the downstairs where the elevator couldn't, couldn't be shut again. So it basically kind of locked it down uh, where it couldn't be moved. So that's, that's pretty much an overview of it. And then, uh, uh, you know, we did in-depth in investigations on everyone uh, uh, that was involved in the facility. Um, I'm sorry, that three of those four were incarcerated were charged with uh, criminal offenses um, and are, have pending charges as well. Thank you, Sergeant Donigan. I appreciate that uh, report. 
All right, we'll begin our questioning. Councilmember Vercher, you are recognized. Am I the first chair? You are the very first. Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> so, um, Judge, wanna thank you. Um, also, um, I was about to call you Lonnell. I was about to call you Councilman, too. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Matthews and also the representatives um, here also with um, YOI. And I know I'm laughing, but uh, just for the audience, this, this is truly um, a, a serious matter for our city. But this, this committee meeting today, it just demonstrates where we are um, as a city. And I wanna thank the judge and um, just, just her leadership for, for owning it. Um, an apology goes a long way. It really does, but it's even better uh, without excuses. And while you were up there and just listening to the gentleman with, with uh, YOI, because um, I came in prepared um, with a lot of questions and just from um, what, you, what, what I've heard from the gentleman with YOI and from, from the, the police department too, um, it sounds as if you already have your corrective plan um, uh, in place, so I just want to say, just want to publicly, because we don't get this a whole lot where we have um, uh, department heads and bureaucrats come before us and actually own, own an incident. Um, that takes a lot of courage, um, and it just reminds me, uh, when I was in the Navy, um, uh, one of the things that we had in our camp was uh, to be in leadership, you have to humble your pride and you have to be courageous in admitting your, state, your mistakes and wise enough to correct them. And your leadership, you've demonstrated that by collaborating with um, the Sheriff's Department, um, Sheriff Darren Hall here, and also with MMPD for their insight in the investigation. And I know those details were pertinent um, with you uh, to be able to formulate a corrective action. And I'm really glad to hear as it, as we always battle with affordability here in this city um, that YOI has taken it upon themselves to increase the salaries uh, to $15 an, an hour. I also like the gentleman, and I apologize I didn't catch your name. Um, if you can just go into detail a little further, usually, you know, as council members, we don't get into the weeds of personnel matters, but I think this, is, uh, this will be an exception um, considering the circumstances. If you can give us a little more detail as it relates to um, the recruitment um, and the timing of the training, um, performance evaluations, and things that we're gonna do to, to, to mitigate so that we will, we will ensure um, that we won't have an, an issue like this again. And, and, and Judge and your team and Councilman Matthew. Mr. Matthews, thank, thank you all again, Sheriff Darren Hall and the police department. Um, just for just for resolving this so expeditiously. That's all I have, Chair. Ms. Teal, I believe that was a question for you. Did you okay. get that? Yeah, I'll recap. Um, just just give us the details of your recruitment efforts, how you recruit, um, who who you're targeting, how we can assist you as council members in those recruitment efforts. Um, training, you don't have to go into debt. Uh, for me, how long your training is, um, is there opportunities for, um, uh, in, in, my in my position, my profession, I'm sorry, I'm always having to go through continuing training um, because just, just the nature of the job, things changes, refreshers and so forth. I don't know if that's part of the teams, a part of the corrective action plan or not. Performance evaluations, um, prob probationary periods, those kind of things that were those triggers that we can identify on the, on the front end just to make sure that um, we, we don't have individuals that's on staff that's not um, necessarily uh, performing at the standard that we would allow them to perform at. So we won't have to come back and be talking about incompetence as it relates to them serving the city. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'll start with rehashing what we've done as far as the, the rates of pay. Um, as we mentioned earlier, starting pay was down to 12, 12.50 an hour. We've uh, created three levels of youth care worker. And for those that don't know, that's the direct care staff that work with these kids on a daily basis that were part of the uh, escape. 
uh, that will be the level one would be at 15, two at 16, and level three at 17, with shift supervisors m moving to $19 an hour. Um, in regards to recruitment, we use various vehicles. We use uh, uh, social media through Facebook, LinkedIn, and then we use Indeed to, uh, to post jobs. We utilize our website to get the message out of vacant positions. Uh, we really lean a lot on word of mouth, uh, utilize our advisory board members, our faith-based partners, and even other staff that are currently employed with us. Um, we vet these candidates thoroughly. They go through extensive background screenings to ensure they have no disqualifying offenses. Um, to be honest, even if they have an offense that's not disqualifying, I review each of those files personally in order to assure that you know, this is someone that upholds the YOI standards and, and our, our, our minds. Um, then each employee goes through three weeks of extensive training on site where all policies and procedures are reviewed, handling with care techniques are reviewed, and all the protocols of the detention center are reviewed in detail. And trust me, through this training process, my team members are observing these folks to say, okay, you got through the interview process, but we got three weeks to look at you here to see if this is somebody we want to hook, hook up with for an extended period of time. So then once they're on board, there's a 90-day probationary period where the uh, youth will have on-job training, will have a coach to help manage, help work. Is this what you thought this was when you went through training to reality? Ensure it's a good fit. Once through 90 day, there's an annual evaluation for every employee that's standardized, that goes through each of the tasks they're responsible for and completed face-to-face -face with their supervisor. As a follow-up to that, uh, if I may, um, have you done any uh, examination or studies other than uh, uh, looking at increasing in pay uh, as to what retention issues you may be having? I know as a comparison, uh, we the police department's working very hard to take a look at uh, uh, retention issues within their department. and. Uh, uh, you know, that requires a little bit of time, a little in energy and study. So can you speak to that? Yes, sir. Uh, Commissioner, we, um, I think we have a very robust retention uh, policy. I hope with this wage floor coming up a little, we won't lose people hopping from job to job. But uh, we have, a, um, a, it's called a TLC program, Teamwork Leadership Culture. It's a, uh, a CHIP program that recognizes staff for doing the right thing immediately upon visualizing that. So a supervisor would go up to the staff and reward them for doing a positive thing either with another staff or another kid. They take that, they can redeem that for various awards as vacation time, gift cards, shirt, backpacks, whatnot. It seems to be going very well. Additionally, we have a robust employee of the month program and employee of the year program. And I constantly ask my team if that's being received well and they say it is. So we're hoping that will help at the same time. We've got a 401k with a 4% match. We just put that into place. So we're hoping folks will understand the importance of saving for the future and contribute to that. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't, but we have that. And we have a, a very robust benefit program that I think is, uh, consistent with anything in the in the area. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Johnson, you recognize. Councilmember Virtue, if you have other questions, I'm gonna come back to you at the end. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I poured through all of this stuff and took an inordinate amount of time to look through it and a lot of things were disturbing and I started with the police report um, that was very thorough and I appreciate everyone's hard work there. Um, a perfect storm, I guess, is true, but I, I don't want to just say it was a perfect storm. I can't imagine that it was just the perfect storm, that, that things like this aren't happening on a regular basis. They may not have happened all at the same time to allow certain things like this, but I feel like um, there's management issues, and um, for, uh, for, I think from both sides. So I wanted to start off by asking who specifically is the contract monitor? And who you are, are you asking? Um, yes, I'm sorry, I'm asking, yeah. 
<laughs> Judge Callaway. Thank you. Um, our specifically our contract monitor is Ms. Latana Williams. Um, she that's not the only contract that she monitors. She monitors both the YOI and our, all of our other grants that we have. Um, that's part of her job duties. Um, I will say that Ms. Williams does a, an outstanding job, in my opinion. Um, she literally comes to detention sometimes at three o'clock in the morning to check the count. She comes. Um, whenever there's an incident, um, she's here on the weekends. Um, she clearly puts in more than the 40 hours that we pay her to do um, on top of the other duties that she has. Um, so she is our contract monitor. Okay, so it is an active monitoring. She's going in and doing her own audits. She's doing her own observations. Um, okay. On a regular basis, yes, she is. Okay, so one of the problems was the camera system, and I know that's handled by Johnson control or something. Um, what, I, what I don't understand is when we had the surge in March, because I asked these questions and I know some of you are not privy to it, but um, so there was a surge in March that knocked some of those cameras out. And so there was a limited function um, of those cameras and some cameras were completely taken out. Um, we weren't notified that that functionality was limited until December the 4th, which was obviously after that happened. And so who, was that our responsibility? And I say our as in us. Um, was that our responsibility to go in and monitor um, the equipment type things? Or are we reliant on the contractor to report those things to us? So, um, and, and just for history, for everyone who um, doesn't know, there was a power surge that happened in March of 2018 that caused a lot of damage, significant damage to the hardware system that um, operates our um, security systems, both for what we call courtside, which is our security um, office that's down in the basement area, as well as for the YOI side, the detention side. Uh, we were aware of some of the problems that were happening with the security system, particularly the ones in, that we were seeing every day. We knew all of those, um, uh, the errors that were happening on that one. We knew some of the things that were wrong with the YOI side, but we weren't uh, fully aware of all of the functions in the camera system that weren't r working. Um, we would, there's not a, a way that we would have known that it wasn't functioning without them letting us know. Um, and, and so we, we couldn't have known. Ms. Williams probably did, and I'm sure and many times, went to mass control and looked at the window, or looked at the windows, but we probably didn't have the expertise to know which ones weren't working at that time without someone telling us. And so whoever was in master control when Ms. Williams would come in to look at some things wouldn't say, by the way, we can't toggle between. That's correct. And so are those questions that maybe should be asked on a regular basis at the, going forward? Absolutely. Okay. On the, now that we understand <laughs> what the capabilities should have been for those cameras, then we definitely know that we should ask those on a regular basis to make sure that all of the equipment that, whether we're responsible for the equipment or YOI is just responsible for it, that all the equipment is working appropriately. That yeah. is definitely something we will do from here on out. Yeah. And just to make sure that there's communication going back and forth constantly and that there's certain questions that are always asked and checklisted and those types of things. Um, the other thing that, that bothered me when I was looking at the report and I was looking at the policies um, for, from both Metro procurement um, and YOI, there were some um, discrepancies, um, specifically with whether or not Mr. Jones should have left the building to go after um, the youth. Um, in one policy, it says they can. In the other policy, it says they couldn't. Um, so are we gonna be reviewing policies and procedures to make sure that everybody's in line and everybody's in, on the same page? Absolutely, and again, Councilman Johnson, what happened was in our RFP and the contract that we had with YOI, it specifically says that when an incident of an escape happens, that the employees have to immediately call the, the police, immediately call the contractor, and they cannot leave to um, apprehend the 
Go ahead. Okay, they cannot leave to apprehend the escapee. But in the YOI policy, it says that they can leave. Um, right. And, and, and so that is definitely a discrepancy. And so we were not aware of that discrepancy. Um, and so that is def definitely something that when we do a new contract with whoever it is that we contract, that we will make sure that they do not have any policies that are in conflict with what our metro policies are or what our, what our rules of our contract are. Right. Okay, um, I'm sorry, I'm asking all the, a bunch of questions. I have a question for YOI specifically. So are there checks and balances systems? Um, it was bothersome that the four youth that were allowed to be out past curfew when nobody was supposed to anyway, but also um, they three of the four did not have the number of points that they should have had to be on that particular detail. And the one youth that did have the number of points was a, according to the police report anyway, a known favorite of Mr. Jones. So is, am I correct? Mr. Jones? The, yes. Yes, yes. Okay, so it was a known favorite. So then it makes me question, should he, you know, what's the, what's the validity of this point system? And were his, what, were his 85 points valid for him to have that anymore? Who's check and balances on who's giving points, how they're allotted, and what different employees are doing or not doing with regard to interaction with the youth? Uh, well, since this incident has happened, as Mr. Hill mentioned, um, I have been permanently assigned also with Mr. Jamie Hubbard, who's uh, corporate compliance uh, for the Tennessee area. And I am on site um, daily to provide uh, uh, oversight on the day-to-day -day operations, which includes those point cards. So there's a daily fidelity check that's completed and at 10 a.m. daily, that is reviewed um, during the morning management meeting. So if there's issues, concerns, or how the points are uh, issued, um, then we immediately rectify the problem. But I have been on site um, since this incident occurred. And relationships between detainees and staff if there's, I mean, to, to, for everyone to know that this detainee was a favorite of a staff member, I feel like is inappropriate. Um, so it, are there checks and balances to prevent those types of things? Yes, and we also do, we also do quite a few fidelity checks, which includes uh, staff and youth interactions and uh, relationships. So not just this specific incident, um, which involved Mr. Jones and, and, and that young person, but also all staff members. Um, how do they interact with youth? Is it appropriate? Appropriate. So we are monitoring that on a, a daily basis to include non-traditional hours. Um, we also um, have been working to include the holidays, Saturdays, Sundays, sun up to sundown. Whatever it takes is, is what we've been doing um, uh, since this incident and until further notice. Okay. Councilmember Johnson, let, let me move to another. Uh, yes, I'm another done. Councilmember, and I don't want you to be done if you have more questions. Okay. I'm going to come back to you at the end. Uh, uh, she exercised her vice chair privilege to go over her allotted time, right. just so you all know. <laughs> uh, Councilmember Nash, you are recognized. Testing, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Judge Calloway, has, has our security always been contracted out, or have we ever done it in-house? So um, as, as far as I know, it's been contracted out for at least the last 20 years. Um, I've been part of the juvenile court since 1998, and it's been contracted out since that time period. I, I, I'm not exactly sure when it changed over. Oh, it's, okay, I've been told it's 25 years, so we've been contracted out for the last 25 years. Thank you. And um, do we have, obviously there were, the policies were not all that bad. It was obvious, though, that we'd become lax and some policies were violated. Um, but aside from that, do we have regular escape drills? I mean, it's, it's one thing to have policy, it's another thing to put it in practice and uh, do we, you know, somewhat like a fire drill. Do we, do people know what to do, where to go, who to call and when to call, and do we practice that at all? So we actually have uh, quarterly drills and we have a drill schedule. So um, to include escapes, but um, natural disasters, uh, medical drills. So we follow our YOI company-wide uh, drill schedule, which uh, also includes escapes. 
And just one more issue. Uh, the, the point system, uh, obviously I, I, I spent enough time around corrections, not necessarily in it, to, to understand the value of being able to reward good behavior and the like. Uh, uh, but I know when we do reports at the police department, you have a, an officer fill out the report, the sergeant signs off, uh, depending on the kinds of reports, uh, uh, it might go on to a lieutenant then. So I, I'm wondering, do you do anything like that with the point system? Uh, your, your first line supervisor uh, does the uh, point, and does anyone check that immediately, kind of in that same time frame day? Yes, that's, that's the system in place, and that's what should happen. Unfortunately, during this incident, um, there might have been some checks missed. I can tell you now they are being checked um, not only once a day, but multiple times throughout the day across um, first shift and second shift. Um, and then also uh, by administration um, at 10 a.m. daily. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Nash. Councilmember Rosenberg, you are no, uh, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for putting this together. Um, first of all, I, I'll be real quick. I agree with Councilmember Johnston that selling the, uh, calling this a perfect storm is really overselling these guys. Um, this was not Shawshank Redemption. It was pretty uh, mind-boggling that, that the, that sequence of events was allowed to occur. Um, I'm also pretty troubled that cameras were left inoperable for that length of time. That seems like negligence on someone else's part. Um, I'd like to ask YOI um, to follow up on the chair's question that I think might have been misunderstood, and that is, is there any kind of survey? Are you collecting any data on what is causing employees to leave besides concerns about pay? Has there been any study of other reasons for employee turnover? Well, I'll, I'll do my best and pass it to Dallas, but I don't want to oversimplify it. I think the, the growth of Nashville and the employment opportunities has, has put a crunch on us, and I think uh, we're getting people to come in and they were accepting the position, but as soon as they found one for 50 cents more, they hopped to it because they weren't that person that was doing the position for the passion of making a change with the kids. So that's why we are hoping, and we've seen positive results already with <clears> our <throat> current recruiting classes, that this two and a half, three dollar bump in pay should be able to bring us more competitive with those entry level positions. I appreciate that, and I get that point, and also, you know, the point that Judge Calloway also made about other opportunities for the same price. I think that it's always worthwhile to see if there are other things besides pay. You know, there could be other conditions or other things surrounding the jobs that could make up for another dollar in pay if, if things were better on. And I think that that's valuable data to have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Rosenberg. Councilmember Allen, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate you letting me speak, even though I'm not on the committee. Following up on, on some of the questions that Councilmember Johnson asked, were, were these youth scores that were below the 85, were they atypical, or were, were many of the youth below that, and so there weren't any others that would possibly be out doing <coughs> cleaning? I mean, was it a coincidence or really egregious that these four were out, or is it suspicious is where I'm going? Uh, <coughs> It was a decision that that um, on-duty supervisor uh, made at the time, Mr. Jones. Um, those four youth should, all youth should have been secured um, in their room at the time of the incident. Um, um, upon his uh, own decision, uh, he did not like the way the facility looked, the appearance, and he made the decision to um, handpick those young people to um, clean um, the error that was identified where the youth escaped. And um, can you review, or, or the, whichever group is most appropriate, the consequences that those employees faced as, as you began to realize what the, what the sequence of events is, what, what were the consequences for those employees involved? So initially we placed the employees on suspension um, pending the investigation um, and um, as we were able to conduct our investigation and our findings, um, unfortunately we uh, had to terminate employment. Uh, what Thank you. To you. Is, is there any further investigation being done into 
the possibility of bribery or something especially egregious? Uh, not, at, not at this time. Not at this time. Okay. Um, in terms of prevention in the future, it sounds like your um, your interpretation is that perhaps low pay is what has led to dissatisfaction or whatever. Are there other, um, I guess, other measures you're taking to ensure that employees don't make equally bad decisions in the future? Yes, as Mr. Hill mentioned, all of our staff have been um, totally retrained. We actually did a specialized training specifically surrounding safety and security. Um, we also had our master control operators, uh, again, again, specifically trained, and we identified uh, specific uh, master control operators to work um, are only allowed to work um, in mass control, and they were provided with uh, specialized training from uh, other senior leadership within the YOI organization. And we... Oh. Councilman Pulley, if I can add one thing to what Councilman... Yes, ma'am. Right? Um, as to um, there were other consequences for the employees, um, and I, I don't know if Sergeant Dunnigan wants to talk more about it, but three of the three out of the four, I believe, were um, criminally prosecuted as well. Right. Any other questions, Councilman Rowland? Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Swope, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, let me say thank you guys for owning up to this. Um, as the councilwoman in the back of the room stated so eloquently earlier on, uh, it, it takes some guts to stand before us and say, listen, we screwed up, and we screwed up big. Um, so Mr. Hill, thank you. Judge Calloway, thank you for that. Um, this happened to happen right when this city was going through probably its biggest, let's just say, budget crisis in history. Um, so with that as a preface, you can kind of guess where my next question is going to go, and it's going to start with Sergeant Donegan in the back. Do you have any idea what the reapprehension of these four youths actually cost the department? Yes, I do. It uh, total for manpower, uh, vehicle use, helicopter use, um, $253,490.42. Thank you very much. So let's come back to contractual obligations from YOI. What is YOI contractually obligated with the city and or the juvenile justice department? What are they responsible for due to their specific staff's negligence. Judge Can I, uh, let me refer this to uh, our legal counsel, uh, 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 Mr. Cooper. Counselor Cooper. So I've been in uh, contact with the Department of Law uh, going back several weeks about this issue and they are actively um, in discussions with, with the company about that issue. Um, I can't really go into detail since it's still an ongoing discussion, but um, those discussions are underway. So am I to assume by what you just said that the city is looking at restitution from YOI for the expense that MMPD had? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Swope. Councilmember Withers, you are recognized. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you for recognizing me to speak. Yes, sir. I'm not, uh, I don't serve on this committee, but I do want to um, share that the juvenile justice facility is located in District 6. I'm very happy having Judge Calloway there and all the great work that she and, and her staff do. Um, having said that, I, I do want to convey uh, a very personal um, uh, sense of alarm that many of my constituents felt uh, when this happened because this is in our uh, area uh, of town. Uh, along the border between districts uh, six and five. Um, uh, that uh, area, as you come across the bridge over here, uh, also is an area, frankly, with, uh, I guess, a lot of visibility challenges. If you were trying to find someone, it, it could be potentially very difficult to, to do that because of there are bridges, there are um, just a, there are underutilized parcels, there's an interstate, there's a lot of, a lot of dangerous um, uh, areas, uh, if, if folks uh, were, were trying to cause trouble, they certainly could. Um, so I'm relieved that the folks were caught, but I do want to convey to 
the company that that, that was of particular concern to uh, East Nashvilleans. Um, Judge Calloway, as I mentioned, does a fantastic job with um, programming, and I, I know with I've got some limitations to the work schedule, but I have been able to come up to some events at the court. Um, I'll get to the building uh, later, but I do want to start with the positives uh, and say that Judge Calloway is very innovative, uh, very compassionate in the way that she runs the court, and everyone uh, associated with that does that as well. Uh, uh, YOI has already spoken to compensation, uh, and I know with more and more companies, sort of particularly nationally, uh, even though our minimum wage is still just a little over $7, uh, nationally, more and more corporations are sort of increasing their minimum pay level voluntarily, in some cases based on state statutes that don't apply in Tennessee, but as a corporate policy, they're doing that. And I know that the, the compensation for some other jobs is now approaching the $12 that probably a few years ago would have been a very competitive wage, and that's changed very recently. But uh, the Juvenile Justice Center uh, does a lot of very positive uh, uh, programming and work with families, community members, uh, and I wanted to hear either from YOI or from Judge Calloway, to what extent are the staff from YOI sort of, how, how do they work together in that? Because I think that that, if you're a person that is involved in corrections but also wants to see the people that you're working with succeed, I would imagine that there are a lot of great success stories that they could participate into, so I wanted to speak to that collaboration. Uh, absolutely, and thank you, Councilor Withers. We, you, we feel your support, and um, we also felt very um, concerned and um, sympathetic for particularly your district members because that was right in their backyard. Um, and so we, we definitely felt that. Um, I will say that um, YOI has worked with us over the years in, in doing some positive programs for our youth and their families in um, the courthouse, along with all the other programs that we have done um, to try and make sure that what the law says is that what my job is to do is to provide for the wholesome um, care and moral protection of the youth that come through our facilities and to do so um, with treatment and rehabilitation always um, number one. And so even those youth who have done some or have alleged to have done some very serious offenses, um, our job is still to try and rehabilitate. And so we have worked um, a lot with YOI in order to do that. I will say one of the things that when we did the original um, RFK with, uh, excuse me, RFP, RFK, RFP, there's so many um, acronyms, but when we did the RFP originally, we did it with an eye towards programming and making sure that we had a lot of rehabilitative, restorative programs within our detention facility. And so we, we put in the RFP that there had to be um, positive behavioral interventions. And so it was YOI's um, when they bid for it and they won the bid, uh, it was their responsibility to make sure that they were <clears throat> providing some of the positive behavioral um, interventions. And so some of the things that they do um, were to um, create a um, a youth council like like you have at any other school um, where the youth can help make decisions, help look at the budgets of the facility and decide whether we want to spend money on um, you know, fancy toilet paper versus a regular toilet paper and get better lotions. And so teaching them how to budget, teaching them how to um, run businesses, teaching them those things. And those are things that we, you know, most of the youth that are in there are still working and doing some very positive things. We actually have some of our restorative arts program people and our, um, some of our, um, the faith-based uh, partners here today um, in support of, of the programs that they do and the things that they provide. And so those are things that we do and we will continue to do so that no matter what is going on, that these children have an opportunity to go through some rehabilitation. I will say that we lack um, more positive programs to connect parents with their children, and that's one of the one of our holes that we have as a system, um, that we don't engage parents enough. We have one group called The Way who come on Saturdays after visitation and provide kind of a support for the parents of the youth that are in detention, um, but we don't do enough education of um, parent good parent behavior, and I know, you know, one of that, those things that happened um, through this investigation and the great work that the police were doing, that there were a lot of parents that were arrested for for helping their youth. And I think if we were doing a better job with 
um, talking to parents and making them understand what their <coughs> responsibility is on parenting, um, not being friends with your children, not aiding your children, but actually parenting your children and holding them accountable and doing the things, then maybe we wouldn't have had to arrest parents and maybe they would have immediately turned their children back over and helped us, uh, the system, to continue to do the rehabilitation treatment that we need to do for our kids. Thank you, Judge. And so just, just to be clear, so what I'm hearing from you, Judge, is that as part of the uh, application uh, for YOI, that part of one of the things that y'all looked at was that they did have at least some degree of um, positive behavior reinforcement uh, programming as part of their policies. And does what, do y'all agree with that from YOI side? Now I want to get to something that I know Judge Calloway wants to talk about, which is the facility. Um, the facility was built prior to the stadium. Um, and uh, was this, was the facility designed uh, to serve, number one, this long, but number two, to serve kind of the population that is housed in it today? I think those are great questions, because as we looked at the situation that was going on, and there's absolutely no doubt that this was um, really because of employee era and security eras, but the design and the makeup of the building did not help that at all. Um, there are, you know, and I always thank the council when I have an opportunity. We did a building study several years ago, about three years ago, and it showed all the inadequacies of the building that we have now. And there was a master plan that was done for a building that would um, be much better secure, um, much better for um, the services that we provide that just has not been able to be funded by, by this time. It is in the capital improvement plan, but it just hasn't had the money with it. Um, for instance, um, there's absolutely no way to get into the detention facility except for through the main building. That is the security risk. And particularly on the weekends when it's not manned, as um, Captain Dunnigan talked about, you can't get in unless you're buzzed in by someone from the back. But once you're in, you're in, and nobody's watching you go. And so if we had had 24-hour security or if we had a different facility, like the one that's in the master plan, there's a separate um, entrance outside by itself that doesn't um, go into the court part of the building. And so that's one thing that we need. Um, you know, there are issues with, you know, why the elevator would go into an area that would connect to the building the way that it does. And so that was a part of the original design that shouldn't be that way. The way that the building is designed now, when we want to egress the youth from the back to the detention facility into the courtroom area, um, you know, there's a hall, there's only one elevator in the back and then the elevator that everybody uses, the public, including the judges, use that same elevator. And so that is also um, not the best for security as well. And so there are several deficiencies within the building um, that we've got to fix and we've got to do better. Um, we can't fix the, the current building now without having a new building to do so. Um, I could go on about a lot of the security issues um, that we have with our current our current building, and we just hope that we'll have the ability to um, fix those things and make it safe for the communities and for our staff, for our youth, and everybody that's involved. Thank you, Judge, and I know you will, and I just hope you continue to emphasize that need to uh, the mayor, the administration, and to the rest of the council about uh, the need to have a, a, a facility that, that meets the modern needs of the juvenile court. Thank you, and I see Deputy Mayor um, um, Haywood here, and so I'm gonna uh, make sure she, she heard all of that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Withers. Uh, Councilmember Bradford, you are recognized. Thank you so much, Chair, for recognizing me since I'm not on this committee. Um, I did have a question about something that really stood out and kind of shocked me because background, quick background, I work for a company that is contract-based. So we constantly are contracted <coughs> with other entities. When it, when it was pointed out by my colleague, Council Member Johnson, that the RFP that you put out had a certain policy restriction on the employees um, leaving the facility in the case of chasing down a youth, whereas the contractor, in this case, um, their policy was different. That, that kind of shocks me, and I want to know, 
it, what, did you just now find out, find out about this difference now? Um, because that should be something that when the contractor was awarded or applied for the contract, they should have al they should have already addressed that. They should have updated our policies because my company, if our policy doesn't line up, we change it so that we can win that business. And if we are out of if we do something or we do not change that, then we risk fines, we risk losing the contract, we risk losing further business or all of the above. So I'm asking both entities here, if this discrepancy was known, um, if it was, why nothing was done? I'm gonna start with that, my answer for that, and then um, my court administrator, Kathy Simbeck, is gonna add a little to it as well. And um, to be completely transparent, I, didn't, I was not aware of the discrepancy. Um, when we first entered into the um, RFK, I will tell you, within 2015, um, the actual original RFK, excuse me, I, I apologize, the original RFP was, um, actually, or the contract that we had with the previous facility was ending December of 2014. <clears throat> I took office in September of 2014. And um, when the procurement reached out to ask, um, you know, what do you want? What do you, you know, how do you want to do that? I have to admit I was a little overwhelmed because I was a new elected official learning the job, learning everything, and, and learning the RFP process. Um, when we extended the RFP, um, process to the fiscal year um, to give us a little more time to really figure out what exactly we wanted to put in there to um, make the the necessary changements and I that is one of the policies uh, you know I had three big books of binders of things to read and I did not catch that discrepancy and so for me I did not know until this incident came when we were like you know, showing why I clearly this is something that should not have happened. It's in our policy, or it's in the it's in the contract that says that way. And it wasn't until then that I that I noticed the discrepancy. I'll let um, um, Ms. Sinback follow up on that as well. Thank you. Um, I'm Kathy Sinback, the court administrator. Um, I I supervise Latana Williams, who is the court uh, the contract monitor for the detention contract. Um, we when you look at the contract uh, provision about escapes, it is very clear that the contractor is to call 911 immediately before they do anything else, and that they are not to leave the facility to go and chase after attempt to apprehend um, the escapee. The policy itself, if you read them side by side, a policy can be more detailed um, than the contract, but the contract trumps. And so always they have to, even if their policy is more detailed and maybe says you call all these people and law enforcement, which it does say, you have to look at the contract to determine how do you do that. So the contract, the policy says you call the, you know, the supervisor, the, the ship, shift supervisor, the contract, um, de the, the detention director, the contract monitor, law enforcement. It doesn't say the order. The contract says specifically call 911 first. And so there is no reason we would have, even if we, we were scrutinizing that policy side by side, we would not have thought that the contractor would not call 911 immediately, if that makes sense. Because the tr contract is always trumps, even if the <coughs> policy contains some additional provisions. The other thing is the uh, the policy allows them to attempt to look for um, the person not driving around after the escape, not calling 911 and trying to find them in their car. It is very, you would never read that policy and think that that's what you're supposed to do. And so um, what it does allow <coughs> is for them to take some measures to try to ameliorate the escape, which they did if you um, are aware of our, there was an attempted escape in 2017 um, where a youth actually came through the ceiling. They weren't able to escape, but they came through <coughs> the ceiling um, in an attempt. And in that situation, you did want the contractor to try to keep that child from leaving the building, which they did. And I think um, what we need to do is make sure that it's absolutely clear what our expectations are in terms of them not allowing an escape to even occur, not allowing the youth to leave the building, but once the youth has escaped, that they call 911 immediately. So it's not clearly in conflict, but there's no reason that they should have done what they did uh, based on the policy or the contract. Okay, thank you, Ms. Simbeck. Thank you. Uh, 
Council Member Bradford. Uh, before we uh, go back around again, I, I just had uh, uh, a little bit of a statement and a question. I wanted to uh, ask Sheriff Hall or uh, the representatives from the Sheriff's Department to the mic to uh, address one particular issue. Um, there were, in my estimation, some very egregious issues here. Uh, and I'll just uh, uh, summarize some of the concerns that I personally have uh, in the egregious nature. Three out of the four of the subjects' uh, behavioral scores, as, been, as has been mentioned a number of times today, were too low, low to even be on this detail. Uh, the supervisor was distracted by uh, an incident in another pod and, and left them unsupervised. They were allowed to board an elevator get down and out, and then once they got out at 9.45 p.m., uh, it basically took 12 minutes to get notification to Director Bratcher, and uh, it took 42 minutes in order to get the police department notified, uh, and prior to calling 911, Director Brad Bratcher uh, ordered the supervisor to call a non-emergency number, which I don't understand at all. These behaviors are of great concern to me, and I just want to make sure you're aware of our concern moving forward. Um, and you know, it's going to take more than uh, what I heard today to give me the warm fuzzies that we really are uh, uh, have this issue under control. Uh, so I just wanted to let you know how uh, a number of us feel about this moving forward. And uh, to that end, uh, I know that there, I've heard from a number of people uh, uh, possibly what role could the Sheriff's Department play moving forward in, in any kind of oversight? And uh, as a follow-up to that question, uh, what kind of expense would be we be looking at uh, if you're comfortable answering that, Sheriff Hall? I have all the confidence in the world in Judge Calloway. She's doing a wonderful job uh, overseeing the contract. Um, I've met with Judge Calloway. She is uh, not only a friend of mine, but, uh, but a leader, especially in the world of juvenile courts. Uh, that doesn't mean that she's not good at the other, but the reality is we need to understand the whole world of detention is complicated, complex. I don't care if it's private. I don't care if there's an escape. It is a difficult, I've spent my life doing this. And it's unfortunate, I've been here 30 years. The only time I've ever heard council members this interested in detention is when something goes horribly wrong. And it's the lost part of public safety. And so I don't get up here much so I just want you to remember, there are people working in my place and y'all's places tonight, and none of you would go do that work. We're paying them, I don't care if it's private or public, I've got staff across the street too, expecting them and asking them to be psychologists, safety experts, sometimes uh, security uh, wizards. So. I, I want to just pause because we have an opportunity. This is a crisis. But let's don't pretend that if this company walks away today and we don't accept our responsibility as a government to treat people who are in detention, and I'm, not, I'm talking about investment. Buildings won't solve the problem. It'll help. Salary increases won't solve the problem. It'll help. But, but I want every time you guys get issues about public safety, I want you to, I'm asking you to think about juvenile court, think about across town where we're housing some 3,000 people, adults. And as long as you don't hear about us, we're doing good, you think. And I just ask you to take the time under the crisis to appreciate how difficult this work is. And I've shared this with Judge Calloway, I'm not, I'm not speaking out of turn. I'm a little uncomfortable blaming any one entity here. Private or public, don't listen to that. That's not what this was about. I've seen people escape from governmental facilities. Lord God, first time ever we have someone trying to break in our place this week. <laughs> so let's don't make it simple. It's not simple. And I shared this with, with the juvenile court. They have a huge challenge on their hands. It's not because four people got out. The individuals we're dealing with are difficult. It's hard. 
I tell my employees all the time, this is the only place you ever go to work where everybody there doesn't want to be there. So it's already a negative environment that we're trying to produce, as, as Judge says in her court and us too, some positive results. It's hard. But, but I, I want us all, I'm asking you, to take a look at what happened. Let, let's go try to address it. Make sure it doesn't happen that way again. But I promise you, whoever you hire and whoever you elect and whoever you elect, you're not going to eliminate this from happening in some form again. I promise you. It's how do you deal with it? What do you really want out of it as a government? And, and, and I don't have the solution, but I know they're not simple. It insults me to think what we're paying our people. And it's not because it's, it's this group. Keep in mind, we're paying them. We know what we're paying them, so we're guilty too as a government. And my people surely aren't getting rich, and they're not privately paid. So I just want us to take a chance, take an opportunity to say, wow, this is a crisis, and let's improve it. But I hope there's something that resonates beyond one night. This money that it costs to go find them, thank God no one was hurt. It's going to happen again, no matter what we do, in some form or fashion. So I hope, take the chance, take the opportunity to not just talk about this subject tonight. It's complicated and it's hard. I told Judge Calloway, we will give you every resource we've had, we have. I have nearly 1,000 employees. I have many, many, many more people in custody than they do. That doesn't mean we're better at it. We're more used to it, at least in the adult world. We used to house the juveniles that we're talking about years ago, the adult bound over cases. So we'll do everything we can to help. And I'm talking about staff, time, resources. We do monitoring of other contracts. We do a lot of similar work. Uh, the Sheriff's Office has our hands full. We have complexes opening up and a lot of things we're trying to do. Uh, I have the confidence that they will get this where it wants to be. Uh, but I wanted two minutes to ask you to think bigger than what's just happened. That's my ask. Thank you, Sheriff Hall. I appreciate your uh, eloquent speech. Appreciate that very much. Uh, it is a very, very difficult situation, and uh, uh, we will wade through it as best we can. Councilmember Vercher, I appreciate your patience. Uh, you are recognized. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. Thank you so much, Sheriff. That's a great segue, um, and I don't know how we did this, but everything you said aligns back with where I'm going with this. So I don't want us to get caught up in um, the equipment and contracts and so forth. Um, the, the September audit, 11 monitors, 143 cameras. I think I've already publicly stated this. Equipment building is not the issue. I think for us as a body, we need to make sure that YOI, YOI has the capacity to make sure that they are recruiting and training and evaluating um, competent personnel, personnel to oversee um, the, the youth. So with that, um, I know in the audit, understaffing was an issue. I want to go back. You spoke earlier about um, the, the recruitment and the training. And pay is, is one factor of it. And you talked about how everyone just went through retraining. When will they go through another training? I also want you to talk about the performance evaluation part of it, too. Um, if, if I'm an employee and I get hired and I don't know what the performance evaluation um, is for, for the employees, am I allowed to continue uh, employment? Is there a, a period where I can um, uh, demonstrate certain improvements? What's, what's, what's that actual process? Because this matter, it really just ultimately just boils down to um, a, a really severe personnel um, issue where some, some boundaries may have, have been compromised. Um, so if you, can, if you can address that. Also, um, to Judge's uh, point as it relates to just um, trying to get people to work in their environment, if you can speak to, are we still... Um, having an increase on assaults on staff, um, and if there's any additional resources that, that could be, that's needed to help mitigate that. Um, I want you guys to, to, to use this opportunity to, to speak to us so that we can, we can help, we can help you. Um, also, 
Um, let me go on here. This is my last one too, Chair. Um, the contract was, was five years ago. Is it a five-year contract? Okay, so I say this to my colleagues, and I, and I don't mean it in any kind of way. If, if what's presented and, and if certain things and improvements aren't made, um, we, we know what to do as, as, as a legislative body. So we don't have to bow, browbeat them over, over the contract. T tonight, we really need to, to drill down on and understanding if YOI, if they have the capacity to meet the needs of, of, of the city. And I, I'm not at that comfort level yet, Chair, um, but that's, I'm hoping to walk away with um, a comfort in, in their corrective action plan that they are ensuring us that they are recruiting and, tra and training the highest caliber people that they can to, to, serve, to serve this city. I went out and looked at one of the job positions and the, the minimum requirements is, is one year experience and a, a high school diploma. I don't know if, if that gets us to um, that, that high caliber um, employee or not, but why, why you, can, you can speak to that because it was your job um, posting out there on Indeed. Um, I, I'll recap for you because I know I said a lot. We can speak to the, the training and performance evaluation. Um, it's key for us that we have a level of comfort that um, you can meet the needs of, of the city with competent staff. Why, why the floor is yours if you'd like to answer that. Certainly, so back to the performance evaluation. It's job specific, it uh, touches on each level of responsibility for that specific position. Um, there's areas for improvement, goals for the next period, and the evaluation is utilized and it's scored with a percentage that is then applied towards a potential uh, merit increase on an annual basis for that staff based on that evaluation. And that would be the time the input comes back. But prior to the annual evaluation, there are coaching sessions that take place that gives both the supervisor and the employee times to talk about areas that might need additional training, might need um, improvement by the employee that they address on an ongoing basis as kept in their personnel file. As it relates to recruitment, um, I can tell you since the um, increase, the type of staff that we're starting to see um, on Indeed.com looks totally different. We're starting to get more staff that have experience, whether you're talking corrections, um, working with um, this specialized population, and I think that will help with um, reducing the turnover. Um, I am on the email for Indeed.com, and I can tell you I had to turn it off. Um, and it's just not with uh, unqualified staff, but it, we're seeing more quality staff. So I know the job description has, you know, one year experience and a high school diploma. But what we're starting to see is uh, staff members. Go ahead. You can, you can what finish. we're starting to see is staff members who have uh, more experience. So we're able to recruit uh, those staff members, and we think that will help reduce um, the, the turnover. I can tell you with being on site, it has made, um, I know it's been some debate that, you know, maybe uh, the pay is not the case and it's not just the, uh, the pay, but when you talk about our incentive programs and you add the um, increase in pay, I think that's going to make a huge difference. Um, and I think it will stop the turnover and we will have better quality staff um, to work with this population. Um, but the resumes that we're receiving, um, we're able to be in the competition um, with our competitors, and it also matches well, with the growth of uh, Nashville. Was that all of them? I don't want to. Also, um, I have assaults on, on staff, and I'm, I'm really only drilling down about the, the training, the recruitment, and performance evaluation, because when, when you guys bid, um, your staff experience was a critical weakness that, that was actually noted. So in, in moving forward, Chair, and I go back to your comment, you didn't have the warm and fuzzy feeling yet. <laughs> I, I don't have the, the warm and fuzzy feeling yet either, but um, to, to Sheriff's Hall point, this is uh, complicated, it's, it's complex, and um, uh, 
I'm not a correctional facilities um, expert. It's, it's not my space. But I do believe, um, a, as a legislator, I am here to make sure that I'm asking the, the, the pertinent questions to ensure that you can meet the needs of, of actually serving the city. But we also want to make sure that the people that you are hiring, that, um, that they are safe, too. So it's, it's, um, it's, on, it's on both sides of, of the equation. So uh, assaults, assaults on staff, if you can speak to that. <clears throat> I think uh, assaults on staff, um, I think just working, the more programming that we have, and again, going back to the building, um, it is a tight space um, at, at, at the detention center, but um, the more programming that we have for our young people or the more that uh, we can have a buy-in from them, that usually does reduce the number of assaults. Um, also, it was talked about earlier, uh, making sure that we're watching the staff and youth interaction. So uh, continuous fidelity monitoring, I think, would um, help reduce the overall assaults on, on our staff members. Um, it is a, a nature of the beast. Uh, working in um, corrections or a juvenile um, detention center, that can happen. But um, with ongoing fidelity and monitoring, um, I think that um, we will see a reduction. As it relates to training, um, all of our staff have been retrained. Um, how all of uh, staff also will have a annual training. They will be trained at, at a minimum of uh, 40 hours and any specialized training that is required, that will happen. And if we feel the need that a staff may need to go through retraining, also working with juvenile courts, if we have staff members that might need some specialized retraining in a specific area related to safety and security, um, we'll also do that. Um, as it relates to evaluations, you asked, um, if an employee is within their 90 days of employment, uh, we do have the right, it is in our policy, that we can't terminate uh, employment if we feel they're not um, a best fit. Uh, we um, have really taken a hard look um, at the staff, even the new staff that we're recruiting, just to look at some red flags, and we're having daily debriefings just to talk about um, training specifically, um, how training is going, any issues, concerns, so that we can address them up front. Um, and as far as annual evaluations, annual evaluations are completed uh, every October. And so uh, at that time, um, as, as Jim mentioned, we can do coaching sessions along the way, but um, if we feel the need to separate employment um, at any given time, uh, we can. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Judge Callaway. Thank you, Juvenile Court Clerk Matthews. And thank you, De Sheriff Darren Hall and MMPD. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Vercher, for your uh, questions. Councilmember Johnson, you are recognized. We got about five minutes left. Um, to Sheriff Hall's point, um, I certainly don't want to minimize um, the complexity and the difficulty of your job or your job. Um, I don't want it. I, you know, that's just want to say that. I. And I also agree that it will happen again. We will, we will have escapes again. This one in particular, I believe, was very preventable. Um, we've had a breakdown in, um, in my opinion, in the design and the content of the contract where we have um, policy discrepancies. Um, and in my opinion, it was a policy discrepancy, um, specifically um, where it's, and the only reason I'm saying this is because I want to be very specific about uh, about it in that it says that per policy, Mr. Jones could leave the premises in search of, of the escapees. But in the procurement and negotiations document, it says escapes under escapes and riots, um, it specifically says contractors shall not attempt to apprehend juveniles who have escaped the facility. Well, if you're not allowed to do that, why would you leave? If the only purpose would be to apprehend. So that's a direct conflict in policy. And so for us to hear about it just now, to me, is a breakdown in the design of that contract. There was a, um, a breakdown in the execution of the contract with policies on, uh, on the part of YOI, but I feel like on the part of juvenile court as well. We need to do a better job of monitoring, being very proactive and asking very specific questions on a very regular basis um, and looking very, very hard at what's going on, what's not going on, um, having really good checks and balances between um, the staff members on how staff interacts with the different youth, how staff interacts with d different staff, 
um, how those point systems are done, and on and on and on. Um, the looking forward, so I, just, I said all that. Look, looking forward, um, we have a uh, a dollar amount that I would just receive today um, if we were to take this over ourselves. So now that we have this, and I know that it's an estimate and there's, it's certainly um, very preliminary, but um, this contract ends June the 30th. So I would like to know, since you've, you've put some work into putting a dollar amount to taking it over, if we were to choose to do that, do you have a plan that's ready to be, what happens July 1st is my question. Thank you for those questions. And I will say again, uh, thank you for Sheriff Hall because we had this discussion with him and he helped us to kind of uh, figure out a starting point and where to go. I will say Sheriff Hall shared with his, us his plan or, or the study that they did over a year and a half period, which was very extensive and um, very thought out and thorough. Um, we didn't have the same amount of time. And so the numbers that we gave basically were very minimal numbers and it, it is a um, increase in what would happen. I will be very blunt and honest if if YOI were to walk out, walk away or not get it or or anybody not contract by July 1 or we decide not to do it currently we do not have a plan on how to transition to taking over ourselves. There are a lot of things that would have to go into that um, staffing um, we'd have to be able to hire uh, anywhere between 60 to 65 people um, at a metro salary, which would include benefit, pensions, all of those things that uh, we'd have to figure out how to do food services. Um, for youth, they have to have um, education, and so we'd have to work with <laughs> metro schools to see if, how we're going to continue to do the same level of education. You have to provide treatment rehabilitation services, um, different programmings like the program of restorative arts that we do currently. All of of those things would have to be well thought out and well planned and to be honest I do not think we would have the, comp the capacity to do it by July 1. Thank you Councilmember Johnson, Vice Chair. Uh, this brings to a conclusion the meeting uh, of the Public Safety Committee today. Uh, as we conclude I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank all the council members for your very insightful and provocative questions. Uh, a special thanks to Judge Callaway and your entire staff. Uh, we have great respect for the work you do over there and we thank you so much for coming over here and providing the answers to our questions and being willing to take all the questions that we have of you and uh, we, we look forward to working with you as we move forward uh, uh, to a resolution to this matter and a new contract and so forth. Thank you to YOI, Mr. Hill, and your staff. Thank you for uh, being willing to come up here and uh, take our questions and being willing to work with us as we move forward with a resolution to this issue. Uh, again, thank you, Sheriff Hall, for your insightful comments and uh, you bringing your staff over and being willing to sit through this. And uh, a special thanks to the Metro National Police Department. Uh, thank you for the great work you did bringing the four uh, individuals back to uh, uh, where they belong. And thank you for uh, your investigation and willing to sit through uh, uh, our process with us and work with us moving forward. I also want to recognize uh, former council member and um, uh, Metro office or mayor's office uh, 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 deputy mayor, I believe, uh, Brenda Haywood. Thank you for uh, joining us up here. Uh, and with that, I will bring uh, this meeting of the uh, special call meeting of the Public Safety Committee to a conclusion. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.